Today well, I'm going to talk uh, on the topic on neuroplastics again. Um, in this brief talk, then I'm going to share with you about some of our work and also the work of other laboratories. So neuroplasticity, or sometimes when you read the papers, then they'll call the brain plasticity, means the ability of the brain to reorganize its structure, function, and connections according to experience. And in the last four decades, that there's a, a very significant change uh, on our views about the mature brain. Because we now know that for the brain, a mature brain, in fact, is far from being fixed. And we know that many factors, including, for example, stress, hormones, uh, uh, learning, uh, environmental stimulation, learning, and aging will change the brain structures and connection and hence bring about the functional changes. Now let's share um, some of the you know, everyday experience with all of you. Some of you here may play musical instrument, for example, playing a violin. So for example, when we play a violin, then in fact, all right. I can't find a... It doesn't really show very much. No, okay. Wow. I think you can probably hear me. So when you play the violin, then not only that your ear here is appreciating music over there, which is a temporal region, there's other area like when you have to press the string and so on, there's a motor and sensory input that is going to this part of the brain, the motor and sensory area. And uh, comparing the brains of professional musician and uh, controls, people that do not play music, then we notice that the area like the music appreciation and uh, motor control area, in fact, for professional musicians, uh, they are more active. And thinking about, you know, the motor and sensory input to the brain here, for musician practicing or violin player, practicing for a long time, in the brain, there is special representation in particular brain areas. Then for those who practice for a long time, then in fact, the representation for the fingers in the brain, in fact, is a little bit larger than the control subjects. So if you volunteer, then you can be my subject. So you can start rubbing your hand today, you know, four times a day, 30 minutes every time. So I'll take your brain scan today, and then in a week time, I'll take your, oh, well, a week is a little bit too short. In a month's time, I'll take your brain scan again. And probably your representation will be a little bit larger in the brain. All right? How about driving? You know, we all drive, and some of you may drive in London. And uh, before we have the GPS system, then for those who drive in old city, then you know that you have to, in fact, navigate, remember the map. <coughs> and there's a very smart research group. They're looking at comparing the brain of the taxi drivers in London, then without the GPS system. And then realize that, in fact, the brain we call it a particular, this is a hippocampal region, which is a little structure in the, in the temporal region in the brain. The posterior part of the temporal region here is called the hippocampal region. In fact, it's a little bit larger when the driver's experience increase, and whereas the anterior part of the brain, or brain volume, decrease with the driving experiences. So that tells and in fact, our brain changes with our everyday experience. And just very recently, I received a call from a reporter. This is the very first time I heard about that term, naively, and asking me to comment on something called the digital dementia. And I didn't make any comment because I don't know about this concept yet. But think of saying that because we rely so much on the iPhone and GPS and so on, we are losing this. Then we ask about, okay, with everyday experience that change the brain. So how adaptable is our brain? Can our brain transform different form of information, for example, auditory information, and transform it and adapt it into a visual information? So in collaboration with another lab, we develop, or the, the whole team developed something called the Betcher device. It's called the Betcher is because basically we blindfold the subject, and this subject, of course, is a graduate student. So that's part of the duty of being a graduate student. So basically, it mimics a Betcher device that over here, that there's an ultrasound generator, so emitting the ultrasound like bet. And then back here, that there is a receiver right here. 
So then they will receive the, 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 the ultrasound waving back. So, so as to know where about the distance of an, of, of, of an obstacle, all right? So over the process of learning, so the poor graduate student who is now a professor in the US now. <laughs> <laughs> That's the price to pay, right? So over the process of learning then, not him but the whole group, in fact, we noticed that in transforming that auditory information into visual information, then several parts of the brains are very active in doing the finding. Uh, in the parietal region, in the hippocampal region, in a, a bit of a visual area. So then we talk about why then everyday experience can change the brain. One of the very basic templates is that whenever we have an experience, one nerve cell fire across to another nerve cell. So that's a little connection here. When the firing is repetitive and significant, this connection becomes very strong. So assuming that if I want to learn a new language, this one may cut out another branch and form a connection here. And then with the continual effort to learn that foreign language, this new connection may start to fire and then will form a strong connection. So that's why when we don't use it, we don't practice it, sometimes we sort of we forgot about it. But then when we start doing it again, that connection comes back. So that's basic, the basic template of why experience can change the brain. And in fact, the whole concept of neuroplasticity is very important about uh, recovery from traumatic brain injuries. Now think about this, then we all know that for human beings then, that's sort of the cross control, the left side of the body is controlled by the right side of the brain, and the right side of the body is controlled by the left side of the brain. And uh, this is a patient who suffered from a traumatic brain injury. In fact, it's a surgical removal of part of the hemisphere because of epileptic control. And um, so basically, when we sort of uh, passively move the hand, then we should expect the right hand and the left hand. If we move the left hand, then we should expect something to happen here and uh, to happen to the left hand. And we move the right hand, we we'll expect something to happen here. But if you look at these patients, and this part of the brain is gone, and then the whole thing we organize both the right and left hand, bring about activation in the same hemisphere. So the whole thing moves over. So you'll see in children who suffer from uncontrollable epilepsy, they have to have the half of the hem or one of the hemisphere removed. And to start with them, they may have a bit of motor problems. But eventually, the other hemisphere will pick up all the functions. Well, um, another example, I got one of my, well, this patient came to see me about five years post-stroke. Not this one. This is just a picture clip from the internet. Anyway, it's a very bright patient. And then I, we flew together to Taiwan to do the scanning, because there wasn't a scanner in Hong Kong to do their function MRI. So we flew together to Taiwan to my collaborator's lab. So basically, in the scanner, I ask, I ask her to do something like this. It's a cognitive innovation. So basically, to start with, and I ask my patient to say the word, like blue, green, yellow, red, without any problems, right? Blue, green, yellow, red. And then this is the, the condition that we scan her. You can see that you can do it yourself, too. So this time, you don't say the word, but you say the color of the word, all right? So you probably notice that the semantic meaning of the word, in fact, is creating a lot of interference in your brain. So in fact, when you try to strive for the right answer, then there's a lot of slowing down here. Right? So if you do it, okay. <laughs> Sense it. <laughs> but I can share that with you one time, you know. I mean, everyone got this, what we call a stroke effect. Everyone got a stroke effect. One time when I tested a patient there, I realized that there's no stroke effect. So I think it can't be, you know, it can't be for every single normal brain that's a stroke effect. We all slow down because of the interference. Then I realized that, in fact, my patient just took off the glasses. <laughs> so, so, but anyway, coming back to this patient here, five years post-stroke, and eventually she got a PhD degree. So she recovered quite well. But still, when she saw me, then she had problem walking, and speech was okay. She was a uh, a phase to start with, but uh, when she saw me, then the speech was okay. So I scanned her doing this one. And in doing this task, we know that we did, we did this particular region. Uh, of course, we need this region as well, but this particular region, which is called the anterior cingulum, is a very important region. But look at her. 
we don't see, if you look at the same slides, we don't see activity there when she's performing it. The, the message is that this part is gone because of the big hemorrhagic uh, damage there. But then she performed behaviorally the same as the control group. So meaning that something must have happened in the brain to allow her to do it. So then, so that's uh, we asked about, you know, if there's uh, neural changes in the brain because of the experience. And we would like to know then what are the specific changes that, brought, that can be brought about by extrinsic or intrinsic behavioral input. Extrinsic meaning that there's actual behavioral input, for example, like exercise. And we can lock our student or subject in cage. So we have to use a little red this time to be the, you know, the subjects. So we test a group of our rats that uh, we do allow them to run at a regular time. And then uh, another group of rats that is just uh, being reared in cages that have no chance for doing exercise. Very interestingly, we noticed that for the runners, they have a little bit more stem cells. So there's a positive neural proliferation in the hippocampal region compared with the non-runners. All right. So that's why when I talk, I selected to walk. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And um, so not only that, we treated this animal, this animal with a uh, special agent, so that uh, they are sort of in a depression mode. All right. So when you put them in the water, then they're sort of in a big suspension. They're not struggling for survival. So that's those animals. And we know that for even in human, then when there's a depression, then the hippocampal region got affected, it sort of shrank. So with, um, with uh, exercise, all right, then there's, uh, we observe that in these animals, that's normalization of the hippocampal cell proliferation, meaning that there's a formation of more new cells. And we also notice there's a reversing the adverse effect of the neuronal structure, because when the hippocampal, hippocampus shrank, meaning that it's a dendrite or different structures got shrunken. And we also notice that there's a little bit more neurotrophic factors happening there. And uh, at the system level then, the depressed rat being allowed to run, the spatial memory is a bit better and there's a de decrease in the depression-like behaviors. Now we didn't treat a human with a depression model. This is a study, it's another study we work on human beings and we did lock them up and uh, in cage. And this is a cross-sectional study. We look at young athletes compared with uh, you know, those who do not exercise. And we notice that the specific brain functions, we call the frontal and the temporal functions there, meaning the planning and memory, in fact, is a little bit better than those who do not exercise. Right. For older people, we launched a project looking at if cognitive training in the form of a computer task, whether they can help to improve you know, behaviors and cognitive performance. This is just one example. Uh, we call it a divided attention. So basically, while attending to the amount of money here, then the subject have, they have to also count the number of leaves. So they have to say if this is more than $15 and worth, while at the same time they have to answer whether this the number of leaves are odd number, even numbers. And, uh, and we noticed that with the cognitive training then, uh, the auditory and visual spatial attention as well as uh, attention, and as well as working memory improved. And with uh, 13 weeks, I think, of training. So that's the extrinsic experience I talk about. We actually provide an experience into the brain, like running, or a computer interface. How about mental training? Meaning that you're not doing anything, but you are generating experience from within. So the agent we use here, in fact, is meditation. So we look at it, meditation, because when people meditate, they have to generate a particular type of experience. So we ask the subject to do two tasks. One is to call, call the, a test of sustained attention. So basically, when they look at the numbers, when they look at that specific, well, one at a time, so when the target shows up, so for example at nine, they have to do something. So basically, it's a very, very boring task. That's the best test of your sustained attention. And then another one to test their emotion processing network, we ask them just look at some affective pictures. 
So we find that those who practice for, with over 10 years of experience in a particular type of meditation, we call the focused attention meditation, that the attention network is a little bit more active compared with, uh, with uh, people who didn't practice meditation. Whereas for those meditators who practice an emotional form of meditation, then, there are certain brain area, including this one, and this one, and this one, these areas are important for high order affective regulation, so empathy and so on. So the message here is that specific form of meditation bring about specific changes in the brain. And also specific behavioral changes, not like a general change here. And then emotion type of meditation or emotional type of mental training, in fact, will change the affective network processing. So the previous one, this one, we look at uh, meditators who are training for over 10 years. And then I thought that 10 years, 12 years, 20 years, of course, we could bring a change to the brain, but maybe a little bit too late for me. <laughs> so then we thought, how about shorter time? Can we bring about a change? So we develop, based on our, all our previous findings, then we develop a protocol in uh, eight weeks training. And we realized that even with eight weeks training, we're the focus on emotion, emotion processing, a particular area in the prefrontal region, in fact, there's an increase in brain volume, which is very important for bringing about the affective changes that we observe in our subject. And not only, not only, um, not only about uh, the affective regulation, we also notice that with that short form of training, then a very brief training, then we notice that in a particular area called the amygdala, particularly the right amygdala. When, whenever we are in a fearful state, and our amygdala will just lighten up, all right? And then the particular, the right amygdala is very reactive to negative affective stimulation. So then with well, this eight weeks training, then we notice that there is a change in the, you know, the activity in the right amygdala. Less activity even when they're looking at negative emotion information. <coughs> Okay, so this is sort of the very second last slide. So summing up about what I have said. So for brain functions, if we want to protect our brain, if we want to maintain the brain health, one very important thing is that you, if you don't use it, you'll lose it. Remember I talked about the brain cell and the connection? When there's a new experience, connection will form. But if you don't repeat it to a significant extent, that connect, connection will be gone. And if you use it, then you'll improve it. And we talk about the specific experience will bring about specific changes. Uh, we just said that. And because we want to strengthen the connection and the whole representation, so the rep repetition to a certain intensity is very important to build up the strength of that connection so that when there is a clue, the firing of the whole trace and the representation will be active to bring about new experience and new skills. Before I end, so people ask me about, you know, what are the things we need to do to keep our brain health? Of course, we need to do exercise. <laughs> and uh, nowadays, society, we have a lot of emphasis on, you know, physical exercise. But in addition to that, I would encourage you to also think about the brain exercise. Don't forget that. If you don't use it, you lose it. One last thing. We do, do body checkup uh, and so on. How many of you think about a brain checkup? <laughs> well, this is such an important organ, uh, go really governing our whole life and who we are. So thank you.